It's Zach Eady with the Purdue Men's Basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Boilers in the Stands. I am your host, Greg Braggs Jr. Alongside me, as always, is my guys, Craig Bowers and Joe Jackson. Craig, fresh off the trip from Hawaii, back on the homeland, back from paradise into the cold weather that is the Midwest and Indiana. Uh, but you did a lot of great work while you were out there. Got a little sun on that. Got a little sun on that head. How was it? Uh, it was great and, and just a fantastic experience all around. Um, you know, that that was my first experience at an MTE, um, having press credentials. And I can't say enough about the staff uh, just for being able to move that as quickly as they did from the location they originally planned on in Maui over to Honolulu. Everything was seamless. Uh, everybody was awesome that we came into contact with. And if you've never been into an MTE, just the experiences that you have, everybody's there in the same location for three or four days. So you get interaction with the players, uh, with coaching staff, um, with Purdue sports athletics uh, personnel that you just normally wouldn't get in any other type of environment. So, and then you're in Hawaii and it's 75 to 85 degrees every single day, sun shining, got a beach to go to every morning, walked out there every morning before every game. And, um, didn't want to break that streak as we approached the uh, the end there and and finally pulled it off for the win. Yeah, it was a hell of a week. It was a hell of a week. I want to call it a weekend because it, it felt like an extended weekend with Thanksgiving and then coming all the way here on Monday, everybody going back to work. But uh, what a three-day stretch it was. Purdue takes down number 11, Gonzaga, number 7, Tennessee, and then number 4, Marquette. And, man, you know, Greg Waddell from Sleepers Media, I thought he had a great rant on it when talking about this team kind of just rolling through some of the, the blue bloods in this country uh, the last few years, a 30-3 and three or 33-3 and three record here uh, in non-conference play. I think 33-3 and three is uh, the record where it stands right now. And, you know, they're always going to be defined by the, the failures they've had in March. But no Purdue fan, you know, you can let the haters say whatever they want. They're going to say, you know, they're going to constantly point to the North Texas and Fairleigh Dickinson and St. Peter's of the world. But as a Purdue fan, I would encourage you to not take these games for granted, not take weekends like this for granted. Uh, you know, like Zach Eady said, he's like, I haven't lost one of these tournaments yet in November. Well, that's that's not normal. You know, this is the third year in a row that Purdue is now the number one team in the country. Um, maybe there will come a day where you say, okay, whatever, that's just par for the course for this program. But for me right now, I'm still at a point where I appreciate how far this team has come and where they are and where Matt Painter has this program. And I, and I would encourage fans to continue to embrace that and appreciate that while also, you know, looking forward and hoping for, you know, bigger goals and, and bigger mountains to climb. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm with you with, on a lot of that. Just uh, enjoy this ride. It's going to be fun. There's going to be at some point, there's going to be a couple downs during the regular season. Like I produce probably going to lose a few games. Uh, take those in stride. Enjoy like these from, you know, we have a Purdue's going to have a couple by games over the next month and a half. Besides those games, it's Purdue's getting everybody's best shot. We're, we're going to be, you know, Friday is at Northwestern, the game where Purdue was number one last year and Northwestern wins it. And we don't have to relive that, but uh, we're, we're about to be back in the getting everybody shot, best shot, uh, stort or court storming, like just, just all of that. And yep. it's a sign of just how good you are. It's, it's a, it's a sign of respect and, and just how good the program is right now. Yeah. You made a funny comment, Joe, like somebody show us where Rutgers is on the map because 
we got to yeah. make sure we avoid them for a good minute. And, you know, Purdue's got some, you know, a Big Ten game coming up against Northwestern on Friday. Um, you know, they got a game here on Tuesday against, you know, an opponent that they should be able to take care of. But then you look ahead to uh, Northwestern. And then, of course, Alabama is still on their schedule here as a non conference opponent in Arizona in Indianapolis, you know, and that's that potentially could be one versus two, you know, in the state of Indiana. You know, I think last year was the first time Purdue had played it in the state of Indiana as a number one seed. Now you're getting a number one versus a number two seed. You know, last year, I think they did that when they played Davidson at, in Indianapolis. Uh, so, you know, it, it's an exciting time. We're back right back into the thick of it. They earned it the right way. Uh, you know, Brad Prather says doing it the right way as far as the program concerned, but they didn't, the number one seed wasn't handed to him either. They went out and took it. So I got a lot of respect for that. Icy Mike's in the chat and he, he's like, why, why are you wearing bears items? Well, if you see behind me, I'm not in my normal studio at home. I'm in, I'm in the CHDO sports studios uh, and, and I'll be doing bears pregame and post game with my guys for CHGO bears here in a little bit. So um, initially we were going to do this interview on Sunday and Fletcher asked if we could move it to Monday and we always make sure we accommodate our guests, uh, when they, you know, give us the time they do here on boilers in the stand. So, uh, we're excited to have Fletcher lawyer join us in just a few minutes. Uh, he's just getting done with practice. He just texted me here a few minutes ago and he'll be on, uh, very shortly. So we're excited to talk to him. If you have any questions in the chat, uh, put them in there and, and we'll highlight them. If, uh, we have time to get to him at the back end of our interview. We'll try to ask him as many as we can. Uh, Fletcher came on last year, and he's been pretty gracious with his time with us. So uh, it's just a lot of fun, and I'm excited to talk to him. Obviously, I think we all know from the rant that I had after the Tennessee game where I was going after some fans for, uh, you know, you know down, down talking, you know, Fletcher for his performance to start the year. You know, Fletcher, I think, really finished the tournament strong. Oh, no doubt. And I, I mean, that Tennessee game was just an unbelievable performance. And, you know, I, I made a comment not too long after that game. And my brother's the one that actually kind of pointed it out. When you when you look at that Tennessee team or just that game in general, there's guys out there that look like they're sculpted out of clay. <laughs> I mean, that Tennessee team is ripped. They are fit. They are bulk. And Fletcher's just throwing his body around everywhere. And how he takes the contact that he does at his size consistently and still finishes. Not just takes the contact to draw fouls, but takes that contact, keeps his head up on the rim, and finishes just some incredibly difficult shots. You just wonder how he manages to go through that for 25, 30 minutes, however long he's out there, and how his body withstands all of that out there. Um, but on, on a day where there were guys built like gladiators out there on the court. Fletcher lawyer was by far and away the most imposing character on that court. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, you know, and that's the thing I, I you know, it, when you look at this team, I, it was clear from the start that they had a little bit more athleticism than they did last year, but the experience I think was a lot different too, because Joe pointed it out a few times. They really didn't play their best basketball for those three games. Um, last year when they won that tournament, they were playing the best basketball they played all season. Um, so for them to not play their best basketball, but not let the pressure of the moment overcome them and lose one of those games, I think speaks to just how mature or more mature they are. You know, I think more, uh, all, you know, it, once they become seniors, they're going to be like freaking RoboCop out there. They're going to be, they're not going to be phased by anything. There's still things they're going to experience this year, but you can just tell uh, the journeys they went through last year, have them ready for this year. Uh, Joe, you're, um, I don't know. Can you hear him, Craig? I cannot hear him. I think you're on. Wait, am, I, there, am I good? Now there you're you, there you go. You're good. okay. And if, right. you, if you're As, lagging a little bit yeah. and you want to uh, reset, you, you're more than I'm welcome gonna, to. But I, yeah, I'm just but gonna I'll reset. I'll come you, back Joe. in. Yeah, you do whatever you need to do. I'm gonna reset I'll real friend. quick. Be right back in. Okay, Joe's gonna reset. Uh, Fletcher will be joining us shortly here. Uh, appreciate everybody tuning in. Make sure you hit the like button, subscribe. Uh, we appreciate everybody hanging out with us here to start the year. 
it's going to be another fun season. Um, we got a lot of stuff planned. So got merchandise on the way. There you go, Joe. Now you're looking clear. I don't know what there you did, go. but we need you as clear to see that beautiful smiling face. Thanks. That beautiful red hair of yours. Ethernet's the crazy thing. Is, you, know, <laughs> you plug Dude. it in and, and internet just works better. Do I need to step out for a minute, Greg? Or no, no, I'm just <laughs> admiring his beauty. You know, he he had the swag the other day with the plaid. You know, and I just we always admire I Joe. Three for, different Hawaiian shirts last week. While yeah, we yeah, I, Hawaiian, Hawaiian shirts. You you are the kind of you're the swag guy of the crew. You know, I, I was I mad. Him. I was Go mad ahead. I didn't get to come on the last day because that's that's the day I wore my Hawaiian gear to the game. Um, oh, nice! But they're just if, if anybody was wondering why I wasn't on last week for the last two games, there's just um, that's not a huge space over there. It's a nice facility, but not a huge space, and there really just wasn't room for me to dip in anywhere to be able to hop on the game ex or the post game show, except for that one day, because there was a two hour gap between the two games. So. Well, and that's okay. We had Ben Kalzinski from ISC Purdue jump in and, and we appreciate those guys at ISC Purdue. They they've um, provided us with graphics and pictures and uh, they come on our shows and, and they've always shown us a lot of support and we always show them a lot of support uh, for, for what they're trying to do as well. They do great work. So make sure, make sure you follow them at ISC underscore Purdue. Um, but no, I'm happy you were able to go out there and have some fun, got some fun content, got to watch some great games. Hey, you know, they, they could have lost to Gonzaga the first game and been playing in the third place game. Nope. You got to, to see three of the best games, yeah. uh, you'll see all, all year, you know? So, uh, that's, that's great. Makes it even more worth it. So, uh, we got plenty of post game shows to go here for the rest of the year. Tonight's going to be our first player. Uh, current player interview of the season. We had a bunch of great ones last year. Uh, try to get a few more. So, um, yeah, it, you know, Craig, I, I know you had a little bit of a gripe because they're number one in the country. But they were not unanimous number one. Uh, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I just, I really struggle with it. And, and I struggle with AP voting in general when you, when you just study that poll from week to week. But I understand that, as an AP voter, it is somewhat subjective, but within that subjectivity of trying to figure out who the best teams are, I think you still have to look at the body of work. All right. It, it's not a college football playoff poll um, where it's all about resume, their, their future and some, but once you kind of figure out who those top tier teams are, by God, look at what's been done. And, and there's nobody that can lay out a resume of Purdue right now and say, we've beat three top 10 Ken Palm teams in three days in a row. And Oh, by the way, Xavier's like 31 or 32 in Ken Palm. They've got four wins better than some teams that voters gave votes to out there uh, for number one in this poll. And I realize it's a little thing and most people say, just don't care, but man, it would have been really nice to have just ringed out unanimous number one in the AP poll. Um, but there's still time to do that. And some of those teams are going to have to play, um, some more competitive games coming up here quickly. And if Purdue keeps on rolling, it won't shock me at all. If they have that word unanimous in front of number one before the season's over. Well, like Joe said, for going into this tournament, they, you know, they can earn the number one, they can earn unanimous too, uh, by beating the breaks off Arizona in a few weeks, but they got some games before that. You know, they, they got at Northwestern coming up on Friday. Um, I'm expecting to be at that game. Um, and last year that was a buzzsaw that Purdue ran into, a uh, bit of a hornet's nest. Northwestern had one of their better years they've had in quite some time. And uh, Purdue, you know, kind of fumbled away the game at the end. And, and Northwestern, you know, stormed the court. And it seems like every team that beats Purdue storms the court the last few years. So uh, a little bit of a redemption game here coming up on Friday, uh, their first Big Ten matchup of the season. You know, uh, before Fletcher comes on, Joe, you know, the Big Ten's had mostly down a few ups here to end the Thanksgiving holiday week of tournament basketball play. But what are you seeing here from the big 10 here uh, so far before we hear from Fletcher? Yeah. I mean, right now it's Purdue and then it's like two tiers of nothing. And then it's the rest of the big 10. <laughs> um, and it's just, that's what it's felt like. It's, it's just, it's just a hodgepodge. Like you have, like we think, I think we're getting more confident in like Ohio state, Illinois being solid. Michigan state still has the upside and Wisconsin side kind of there. And then it's just like 
it's a whole bunch of teams that are just yeah like they just, i don't know they're just there like they play basketball they have some good things they have some bad things and um only three weeks in but it's like i mean i, I put out mine today and like one of my tiers was literally team six through twelve like i pretty much if you rank them any order i don't think i'd be mad it's, it's just kind of where they're at right now um a lot of teams with a lot of things to figure out uh, there's you know i think some teams are kind of being more defined as like they're good on one side of the ball, but then really bad on the other side of the ball. Um, it's just, it. it's going to be an interesting year. This is not your typical, the past few years of the big 10, where it's just an absolute gauntlet. And you know, you're, you're going to big 10 is going to send nine, 10 teams. Like this yeah. could be a, closer to like a seven bid league. And, and you say we're starting to get a good feel for Illinois, but at the same time, Illinois has not played anybody other than Marquette and yeah. lost to them. So we really don't know about Illinois yet either. And man, I thought I was leaning in Nebraska too hard. So I, I moved him down a couple and then Joe puts his out and he had Nebraska where I had to start with. So I should have, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so hard to tell right now in this league. Default, Cause it's like, yes, they play nobody, but everybody else that has played somebody lost. Yep. <laughs> Still a long way to go, and you know how Big Ten play will go. It'll be uh, quite the grind. Uh, but joining us now is special guest, sharpshooter for the Purdue Boilermakers, back from the Maui Invitational after winning the championship there, taking down uh, some tough teams all week long. It's Fletcher Lawyer joining Boilers in the stands for the second year in a row. We appreciate you coming on, Fletcher. What's up, guys? How you doing? Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're doing excellent. Um, you know, we're just hanging out, kind of uh, reassessing everything that's happened here to start the year. You know, I, I know you were busy in Maui, but I, I had your back on Tuesday after you guys took down Tennessee. I, I don't know how much you pay attention to the chirping that goes on when it comes to social media. I know social media can be a toxic place, um, but, you know, I, I did take exception with when you guys took down Gonzaga and, and you had a rough start. I'm sure you could – uh, admit, you know, your first four games, I'm sure you would have wanted to have better games, but a lot of fans, you know, I think feel like they want to just look at whatever negative instead of focusing on the positive. And, and I thought you turned around that next game against Tennessee and obviously you lit it up. Is there any part of you that hears any of that kind of stuff or even, even some of the stuff where, you know, even now after winning the Maui Invitational, people talking about, your past failures, games you guys have lost in the tournament. Do you listen to that stuff? Is that something that motivates you for better this year? Yeah, it, it's definitely tough because you, you have Twitter, you have Instagram, and you, you try not to follow the people or see it. But in the end of the day, you do you do end up seeing it. So, so it is tough. And um, ultimately, if you want to be a good basketball player, you got to see it and you got to look at it and you got to read it. And you gotta let it go in one year, when in one year and out the other. I think that uh, just being a college basketball player and an athlete in general, uh, it, it's not going to be easy. Whether whether you're winning, whether you're losing. Um, I mean, obviously, we we're number one seed, number one in the country last year, uh, top three in the country again, and uh, it, it's not good enough for some people. So uh, you just go back to that work you put in. You go back to the hours. You go back to the amount of time and thought you put in it, and you can either you can either shut it down or you can just keep pushing forward and keep doing your job. Yeah, um, I, it's definitely a good mentality. I mean, Matt Painter, I think, has had to go through it more than anybody with this program. You know, how much is he helping you guys? You know, to keep your focus, keep your mindset. We watch these awesome, you know, produced videos that the Purdue social staff does, and we hear how the coaching staff is working with you guys game to game, but. How important and how vital has Matt Painter been to you guys to understand how to be the hunted and not the hunters? Yeah. Uh, first off, though, you mentioned our video staff and just the social media. They do they do a great job, a phenomenal job. Always posting great content, stuff we enjoy watching as the team experiencing it and being able to watch it again. But um, I think just coaches and his trust in general. I mean, obviously, it's it's hard to trust a guy that goes over and and uh, doesn't have his best game. But I think he's seen it. He's seen it in practice. He he's proven he's a smart enough guy to look past just one game and 
not read the stuff on Twitter and he gets paid, he gets paid to coach the team, not to do what the fans say. So I think the amount of trust he has in us and the amount of trust we have in him is just continue to grow. And obviously when you're number one seeing you somehow lose first round to a team, you know, you should have beat it's, it's tough. And uh, when people are calling for his head, calling for his job and, it just shows how much those people know because you, the guys that if you're in there during practice every day, if you're in there during our meetings, all of our film sessions, you realize just how knowledgeable he is. And uh, it's hard not to trust the guy that's proven it year in and year out, how valuable he is to a program like ours. Yeah, 100%. And then talking with, talking about Painter and um, it's easy to go into all the offensive stuff that he runs. Something I noticed that I thought you guys started running a bit more, especially in Maui, I thought was like the Spain pick and roll or stack, or I don't know what you guys call it exactly, but where you're setting the back screen for um, while Edie setting the high ball screen. Two, kind of, kind of a two-parter, I guess, with it is um, one, how important is it for you to try to hit Edie's man just because then it, as it frees him up more to get to the rim. Um, and then two is, when you're in that action that I think, you know, I think you guys, like I said, ran a bit more. Is there anything you're looking for specifically from like either Edie or Smith or whoever is at the game? I'm, you know, those are the two obviously that run it the most with you. Is there anything specifically you're kind of looking for in that to either get you a shot or get somebody else a shot out of that? Yeah, it, it's something that we've watched and we've had to guard and it's tough. It's, it's something we've incorporated a lot more. It's uh, something the coaches are getting on me about in transition instead of just standing in the corner or um, just kind of floating and standing in space, go do something. And uh, I think if guys and even other teammates start to see it, that's just how valuable it is to move and do something. It's uh, very beneficial for you because a lot of times I get that pop-out shot. A lot of times Zach gets the lob dunk. It, it's just so many options off it. And when a guy like Zach is so dominant and powerful, uh, obviously defenses gravitate towards that. And when you have someone hitting his man, or even if it's just a quick bump, it really doesn't need to be much, especially if you're – so a lot of times when I said it, I, I look to feel and see what my man's doing. Because if he if he's heavy on Zach, then I'll just try to pop out of it right away. Mm-hmm. But uh, if I feel he's a little less attached, then the more I can screen that big guy or that five, four or five, whoever it is that's guarding Zach, just the more it's going to free him up. Yeah, one one real quick follow with that. Sorry, Craig, is – uh. With if and if if I not remember this right, then my bad. Um, was there a play where you you set that back screen and you just got absolutely leveled in in Maui? Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? That, that was our first set, I think, to open up the tournament. Yeah. Um, against Gonzaga, I got into that first quick Spain ball screen, um, and I just got ran over. I I can't it was, believe it wasn't a call or anything, but um, it was like you were taking yeah. a charge. Yeah, I basically did. And uh, you look and see, like, Braden got a call like that. He's just setting a down screen, and the, the fives don't really know what to do, whether to go under it real quick or stay tight. So they just run him over. And uh, I think a lot of times we focus a lot on just screening and setting real hard screens just because ultimately it's going to get that guy open, but it's really – it's a lot of it's for you. And uh, the harder you screen and the more you do screen, the more it frees you up and – uh like you saw on that first clip, if someone has it somewhere, it, I just got completely ran over. And hopefully you can get a quick foul on their big guy, or if not, you just take a hard hit and keep trying to keep trying to push it. Right. Yeah, Fletcher, you you know, all three of those games in Maui, and I was lucky enough to be over there to watch all three of them, were, were obviously super competitive. But uh, the one I want to talk about in particular is the Tennessee game. And as we can kind of see in this picture here, just how physical that game was from start to finish. And you're in there digging down, diving for a ball here in this particular picture. But when you're playing a game like that, that that is so physical from start to finish, there was like 352 fouls. I don't know, something like that. But <laughs> what what does it take from you guys as a team to keep your minds right, to be able to work through that for the entire 40 minutes? And then you specifically – there's some guys out there from Tennessee that literally look like they were sculpted out of clay and you're just banging your body in, you're keeping your head up on the rim and still making shots. What have you had to do in the off season to to get your body right, to be able to handle that type of physicality and those sort of things? Yeah. I think a lot of it has come down to is just, just persevering through it. Uh, Obviously as you guys have seen and the rest of the world seen the college and it really NBA, NFL, whatever you watch, 
uh, refs do affect the game, whether it's positively, negatively, and uh, they're there. It's not going to change. You got to keep listening to it, and you got to keep working, whether it's good calls, whether it's bad calls, whether Zach has two fouls, three fouls, or four fouls like he did in that game. I think it's just very valuable uh, for guys to keep their head down and keep playing. Um, we had a few where we were just like, man, what the hell? I'm oh, sorry. What is that? Like, you, can what is that? you can swear. <laughs> okay. Like, what is that call? But uh, ultimately, there's another possession coming right down. It, it's not um, not like some other sports where you got a minute to think about it. You, the ball's inbounded right away, and you got to go. So uh, really just pushing through that. Uh, coaches kind of have gotten on us a little bit about complaining about calls. Um, but I think we've done a better job this year. Um, I think – the, even that game, like P, PJ was real mad about it. And I said, Hey, look, you guys get mad at us. You get mad at me. Uh, now I'm calling, I'm trying to calm you down now, but call that <laughs> next play, get a good set in so we can get something rolling. Yeah, that's, that's funny. Um, we got Derek Mulliken in the chat. He, he says, uh, Fletcher, my best friend's sister is Kylie Brown. We love you, man. So, uh, we got some people here in the live chat, giving you a shout out. Uh, you know, the one thing that has stood out to me so far this year, and something I enjoy watching you guys try to do more of in games. I mean, obviously, you're going to play a half-court pace with Zach, Edie, you know, and, and using that strength. But when you guys go up tempo, especially here in those last three games, it felt like, you know, sometimes that was to your advantage. You know, how much are you guys trying to push the envelope and and up the ante for more possessions, more shots, and and pick the tempo up a little more? Yeah, I think that just adds another face of our game and it shows something we can also do. And uh, a lot of people, a lot of fans have been talking about how we include a lot of athleticism on the wing with Cam and Miles coming in and they can really get out and run the floor as we've seen a few more lobs this year. Um, it's just another facet. I think Lance Lance Jones really helps with that too. With his pressure on the ball, he can get some steals, break out for layups. And uh, it's hard to win a college basketball game, especially against good teams, when you don't get a few easy baskets. It's it's hard to go 40 minutes and get tough shots. And uh, that's what we focus on getting teams to do, uh, just taking care of the ball and uh, not giving them free possessions. But I think that by us uh, pressuring the ball a little bit more and then uh, really having three guards out there a lot of the time now, like Braden can push it, Lance can push it, or I can push it. I think it really helps with us and uh, our bigs running the floor and just everyone moving around them. Yeah, for sure. And um, as you're known as a shooter and you've put up hundreds of thousands of shots or million or whatever the number is, is there anything right now where like, I, I think most shooters have, they, they know when everything clicks, right? Like you shoot the ball, you're like, yeah, that's in. Is there anything kind of on the other end for you where it's you shoot the ball and you're like, Oh, this was, this is off because of this within kind of your form or whatever. Yeah, I, I'd say a lot of it comes down to uh, really just like your legs and your balance and your strength. I think that getting in uh, much better shape has helped me this year. Uh, last year, I thought I was in good shape, but that 40, that 40, uh, 40 minutes a game and uh, playing almost 40 games a year, it, it definitely takes a toll on you. So really just kind of getting more prepared on my body, whether it's eating better, whether it's sleeping better, whether it's rehabbing better whatever for your legs and um i think i think i did notice a big difference once i started doing that and it also comes down to confidence i think you look at the team and right now our confidence is flowing when uh but when you look at towards march last season you kind of saw it die down a little bit so i think just kind of everyone's staying on top of each other making sure they're still still again in the same work i have no doubt that whether we go 20 for 20 from three or whether we go five of 20 from three in a game that the same guys are going to be getting in the same work the next day at, at practice. Yeah. I don't know if you got to see in, in the post game conference after the Marquette game, uh, or did you get to hear what Shaka said about you and Braden by chance? Um, I did. I think one of you guys might've reposted the clip about yeah. us being Purdue and Purdue being us. I, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. So specifically that was kind of where I wanted to go with this question. He talked about one having still, even with having the national player of the year on the team that about how much ownership you and Braden have in the team. And then he said, you are Purdue and Purdue is them. So I guess like, what does that mean to you from a, what, what about you and Braden is Purdue? Yeah. Uh, 
Well, that that means a lot coming from a guy like Shaka Smart. He he's proven it. He's proven his spot in college basketball. Uh, he's proven he's a good guy, which one that that's really important for when you're playing against other teams. The, the respect level you got to have for a guy. But um, I think I think it's I think it's true. I think me and Braden have really taken on that role of just being on court leaders. Um, we weren't named like captain. We didn't really do that. Ethan Morton's kind of been our named and listed captain. But I think during the game, it's it's the amount of trust level we have in one another. Like I know Braden can go make that play to win the game. And I think he trusts me to go make that play to win the game. Uh, I think it's just the work we put in this summer, how much we trust one another. Uh, I have no doubt in him whether he has 30 points or whether he has 10 or 2. I think uh, I, I, I still trust him to go out a great game and be one of the best point guards in the country. I mean, what was it like going up against Marquette? I mean, they really switch – move the ball and, and keep you guys on your toes seemed like you guys were able to match that obviously, but they made it interesting. They hit shots at the end to keep it close. I had a lot of respect for the way they played that game. I mean, two years in a row, it's been a battle with those guys. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it's a team that when we played them last year, uh, Tyler Kolick actually mentioned this to me during the game. He's a hell of a player, but uh, we played that game last year. Neither of us were ranked. I think I think it shows the amount of strength both teams have, and uh, how how we don't really read into that stuff. But uh, I also think it shows the competitive level of that game alone. I think it's two teams, obviously both top five now, but it's two teams with heavy guard play. They they got guys that can score, man. And uh, when you got two guards that are as lethal as those two on Marquette, it's it's one tough to guard and two tough to score on, just because they're putting so much pressure on you to go score again. And uh, I thought we did a good job of u- utilizing our advantage, and that being Zach and down low, we, we got their bigs in foul trouble, which really helped. It, it helped us have our matchups and have our easy post touches, which we wanted. And um, I just think really it, it shows how much of a – how good of a program that is and how tough a beat they are for us to struggle with that and uh, let alone it be in the third game in three days against three tough teams. Yeah, it definitely seemed like um, the depth both teams had, but obviously you guys winning out that had played a big part. Three games in three straight days. I mean, that's something you won't even experience in March, uh, and is a testament to just how many players you guys have that can get quality minutes. One of those players that we've all been really impressed with, uh, even back in the summer when Craig was coming to some of your practices, Lance Jones. Man, this guy can play. You know, and, and what I like most about him. Fletcher is just how aggressive he is, Uh, not afraid to make a mistake, you know, and attack the basket, take a shot. I I always laugh just from following Sasha's career. Whenever a bad shot goes up, I watch Painter's reaction because I know what his definition of a bad shot is, and it's every player's dream shot, which is the heat check, Uh, you know. And so I, I enjoy players like that, though, because it pushes Painter's envelope a little bit of what he's going to allow uh, and I know I'm sure you've tested that a few times in your career, but uh, with Lance, what what has that been like for you guys, like having him assimilate into the team? Yeah, well, kind of similar to last year, we had Dave, uh, a guy that we thought coming in would be the starting point guard. But uh, Braden obviously beat him out, and, and he earned it. And uh, it just showed how, how much uh, trust we have in Dave to go out there and still be a good teammate, still go out there and be a good guy. And I think Lance has just done the same thing. Right away, he came in uh, kind of thinking he'd probably fill that backup point guard spot. But I think as he kept working, as he kept proving to all of us that he deserves to be in that starting lineup and play a majority of the minutes out there, I think it just shows the the amount of trust and friendship we have with Lance. Uh, it, it all started when he just proved how good of a guy he was. He's hanging out with us off the floor. He's He's being a good older guy that you need on a team. Uh, let alone him playing well. That really helped too. But uh, I think when when Lance gets going, I, I, I love it. He has, he has no care in the world. And uh, he, he's told me that playing in Mackey and playing in these big-time environments, playing on the number one team in the country, it, it brings out a different person in him. And I think that's great. I think that if he stops doing that, we're going to get on him because we know how much he can help this team. And uh, kind of jokingly, we were watching me, Braden, and Lance were watching that film with PJ, and he shot one from two or three steps behind the NBA line, and we just all like laughed because we know one, he can make it, and two, it's a little bit of a heat check that he doesn't care if it goes in or not. He's yeah. Win. 
Yeah. No, I love it. Um, pretty good on defense too. Chris, Chris R. Uh, saying in the chat, Fletcher, what's the law? You know, you Lance Jones hits a shot. Did you guys get the tape measure out on this? Like, did anybody find out exactly how many feet that shot was? Joe, you're the anal, you're the analytical guy. Did we ever get a number on how long this shot was? It had to be like what, like seventy ish feet or something. Yeah, like that? I, I guess about seventy five feet. Fletcher, have you ever made a shot in a game longer than Lance Jones half court heave? In a game, no. I think I've maybe made one close to half court at, at a buzzer, but um, I, I made one at camp in front of the little kids. I threw it like a baseball and made it. But uh, no, that was super impressive, and it, it ended up helping so much going into that halftime. And uh, us getting off to a slow start in that second half, just that extra lead helped us quite a bit. Well, and people, there's like people pulling up the the Zapruder film saying that PJ was saying to not shoot. A, is that true? And B, is there a reason he would say that? I think the only reason would be is somehow lose it out of your hands and turn it over and just go into halftime break up 12 instead of them maybe somehow getting a layup. But uh, I, either way, I love that he shot it. One, because he made it. <laughs> and two, it shows he doesn't really care if it goes in or not about his percentage. But right. I think you see a lot of guys in the NBA kind of stop shooting that because of their percentage. But when, when you're in a game like that and uh, you're treating it like it's win or go home, playing out there in Maui, you, you didn't go there to go 2-1. and one. You went there to win the whole thing. It, it, every possession matters. And it just so happened we won by three points and he hit that yeah. shot out. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, before I get to these guys real quick, just to bounce off of PJ, Alex Rockhold in the chat asking, is there a balance of paint and PJ calling plays or is PJ taken over the majority of the play calling? Seems like he's calling them from the TV broadcast. Yeah, so last year it was Terry Johnson calling the plays and um, this year it kind of moved over to PJ. And uh, yeah, Coach Painter during timeouts he'll draw up plays. He'll he'll tell PJ if he sees something he wants to run. But no, I think he's put a lot of trust in PJ to call the eighty to eighty five percent of the sets we run. And uh, as you see that little whiteboard he holds up, he's got a list of them over there. He's looking for a guy makes a shot. He'll he'll find one that kind of runs through that person. But I think the amount of trust Coach has put in PJ has really kind of gone on to us. Like we we trust PJ too. And I think he's proven it. He watches films with all of us, all the guards at least. Um, things we can do, things we see. And it's it's very uh, player coach led. It's uh, He's talking to us. He's asking us questions, what we see. And I think that's just a great way to do it. And so far it's really worked and I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. So when we talk about Maui, obviously Edie did his thing of it was like 25 and 12 and a couple blocks. Uh, running big or kind of theme on this show after our, in our post game shows is we just kind of forget to talk about him because he is so dominant. And what is there to say other than, Hey, he's just the best player in the country. Have you, have you gotten almost used to it? Like, is, is it, do you, do you almost, I don't know if I don't want to say take it for granted, but like having that dominant of a player, is it just kind of just normal for you at this point now? Yeah, I'd say so. I think it, he's proven it night in and night out. And uh, I think that I think that you do get used to it a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's tough to say a guy's going to go get twenty five and ten. But um, with the amount we we get it to him and the amount of deep position he gets, it's it's just such a high percentage that we we got to do it. And uh, I think that Lance has really figured it out, and so has Braden. They've both gotten better at. I think they saw it because I throw it in there so much. Just how much it benefits you, and how much pressure it puts on the defense. And Zach's really worked on. He's gotten a lot better of passing out of it, especially when they go in double. That you just get so many open looks, you get so many open lanes to drive that it's so beneficial. And I think you've really kind of gotten used to it when you see him go get 25 or 26 or whatever, and you still think, man, Zach, Zach probably could have played a little better. Probably could have made a few more shots, but come on, he's still getting 25. I'm on and- the post game shows, Fletcher, <laughs> for the Xavier and the Gonzaga game. He's got 26 and 12 or something. I'm like, yeah. he's had a bad game here, guys. And I'm yeah. like, I feel bad. Like, I, my standard for what Zach's good game is like 35 and 20. I don't know if that's unrealistic. Yeah, he's mentioned it. He's like, yeah, my, my touch just isn't 100% there right now. It's a little off. It, it's something. I'm like, dude, you just had 28 points. <laughs> <laughs> so so I think it might get a little scary once he figures that out and figures out what's going on. But uh, 
Yeah, when when we he trusts us though, that's what's most important. If if he's double, he kicks it out. I think he believes it's going in too. So that really helps with us throwing on the ball because we know if, if it's there, he's going to score it. Yeah, Fletcher. Through basketball in general, I'm just wondering. You know, this this past summer, you got to take a trip to Europe. I think you guys got to visit three or four different countries while you were over there. You get to go to Honolulu this year. Um, we've got a picture here with. Uh, Vince you know, Vaughn. Zach, Zach Eady okay. meeting Vince Vaughn. I'm assuming yeah. you guys all got to meet him. Do you yeah, ever get a chance to, I know it's all business all the time, mostly, but do you ever get a chance to kind of step back and just, you know, take in all the places that basketball is taking you and the opportunities that you get along the way outside of basketball? Yeah, for sure. You, during the time, you don't really think about it, but then you're going through your phone, you're looking at pictures and you see stuff on social media and you really do got to appreciate it. It's it's a game that some people think it's a game, but it's really our lives. And uh, the amount of time we've, we've spent on it, the amount of, amount of thought we've put into it, the, the late nights, the early mornings, it's, it's something that you try not to take for granted, but in the end you are. And now that, and especially now we're making NIL money, it's really, it's a fun job that you get to do. And if you're having a hard day, you got to think, man, I, I just went to Hawaii. I just, I got to miss school for a day. I got to go to Europe. It's it's not a bad life. So whether you had a good game or a bad game, you got a pretty good gig going on. What is your favorite Vince Vaughn movie? Favorite? I'm going to go with, I got two right up there with Wedding Crashers and Dodgeball. Did you drop any any one-liners from any of those movies to him? Because yeah, like if I met yeah. Vince Vaughn in an elevator, I don't know if I'd be able to have a normal conversation. I would just be <laughs> shooting one-liners at him. See, I, w- I was trying to think of one, and my brother was mad at me because we, we grew up watching all those funny movies, all, all the Will Ferrells, all that stuff. And when he says what's up to you or like how's it going, and you hear that, that iconic voice he has, that little rasp in it, the little bit of humor he's got, Man, I wish I would have thought of one as we were thinking about it, but uh, my brother was pissed. I didn't say something about a, a wedding crashers quote to him. Yeah, um, for me, I don't know if you've ever seen Made. It's more one of his more uh, unknown. Uh, you know, he had Swingers, which was out in the nineties. That was one of his first big hits. Yeah, and then the sequel to uh, Swingers is a movie called Made. And it's, 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 it's a deep cut, but I'm telling you, Fletcher, it's one of his best when it comes yeah, to one liners. I'll, I'll have to check it out. Cause I was, I'm a huge fan of him. You definitely should. Yeah. Uh, well, we got I, a few more and then we'll cut you loose. We appreciate you coming on and carving out some time for us. I know how you know busy you've been on the road, you know, in Hawaii and all this stuff. So coming on after practice means a lot to us. So we won't take up too much more time, but we got a couple more. No appreciate you, bro. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to take it back to uh, last season and you know your get your breakout or not a breakout game but a, a huge game for you at Nebraska but then specifically the poster um we we saw some of the drives against like Tennessee in that and they're um funky kind of it just kind of you get the ball up on the rim but against Nebraska you got up and you postered is that just a is, is that like can you secretly do that kind of when you want or was that just a all ad- adrenaline was there for you I'd like to say I could, but I, I've never got one live in practice or anything. Maybe it's just because the legs aren't as fresh as they are for a game. But um, I don't know. May, I do get up there like I can. I just typically don't. And especially like the Gonzaga game, I'd say like I got a few at the rim where maybe I got fouled, maybe I didn't. So I really kind of watched that film and took it in. Maybe I need to get to my floater. It's, it's something I work on. It's something I practice and something coach trusts me to shoot is he saw me do it in high school a lot, but I thought maybe I need to get to my floater more. So with the, with a lot of the athletic big guys and guys carving up space in the, in the paint, it's hard for someone who doesn't do it often. So I'd say it has to be a perfect scenario. And when I'm really feeling it. Well, and isn't it more just about like with Braden at one point at the end of the, the uh, Marquette game, like just getting it up on the rim. Cause you know, Edie's trailing you. Yeah, that, and that's what they that's what they coach us to do. Uh, a lot of times it's tough to get the lob to them, but if you can get that big guy to go and contest your layup, uh, I think I, I watched it today with PJ on the film, the Tennessee game. I had a kind of like a running hook shot that the big guy contested, and I really was just trying to get it up on the rim for him to go get. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good strategy. I mean, you know, he's there. I mean, he's he's gonna he's gonna more times than not he's gonna get the put back. Yeah, yeah. So so you guys got the big Maui win here, all celebrating there with the with the trophy there and all whatnot. And you come home and you start to look ahead a little bit. And I realize, you know, your coaches whatnot are saying, look, no more than one game ahead and everything else. But how do you how do you take the end of last season? And then this early season success and try to parlay that into the rest of your season as you look at it moving forward. Yeah, obviously that's a huge confidence boost uh, winning a tournament like that against, they say, the the toughest field ever. So I think that's huge for us. It's huge for guys like Lance who haven't been there, so to say. Uh, he was in the weight room talking today about, man, I'm on the number one team in the country. <laughs> and we were messing somewhere like, we've been there, dude. We got to keep going. <laughs> we got to keep going. So I think just kind of all uh, keeping it in the locker room, knowing that it's us against everyone else. So, And we know there's a target on our back, but we know the work we've put in and we know the practice that we've done. I think that's huge for us. And um, I think even though they, it, it's tough to say that you got to get ready for March, but I think just us as a whole, we're trying to keep to get everyone together, uh, staying positive, whether we have a good game, a bad game, whether it's a bad bump in the road or a smooth drive. But um, I think it's important that we all just stick together and uh, we can continue to do what we've done all year with all the adversity we've had to face. Is Lance always that happy? Because I got to come to a practice this summer. And the first, I think the first text I sent to Joe and Greg was, about Lance was, this guy loves basketball. Like yeah, he just I, looked like he was having so much fun out there, even in practice. <laughs> yeah, he, he really enjoys it. And uh, he, he's living quite the life right now. He, he transferred to a good team, one that really trusts him. And one he gets to play a huge role in as he helps us win a lot of games. But, I mean, he he's really just plays basketball. He's got like a few classes with since he's already graduated. And uh, I think right now he's just – he's living the life. And you look – you see his energy every day at practice. You see it ready for the game. And you just try to match it because you know he's having such a good time and we just want to keep winning. Yeah, for sure. Um, just a couple quick ones here from our chat. Icy Mike wants to know, how's the squad preparing to take care of the basketball and control the tempo when a bad turnover takes place? How are you able to slow things down and get the you know momentum back in your control? Yeah, one thing we really do focus on is taking care of the ball. It's a, it's a huge stat we see. It's a huge stat. Uh, Do you have a specific number that you try not to surpass? Yeah. Uh, we uh, He writes on the board before every game four turnovers, and that's our goal for the first half. And, like, we watched uh, – we rewatched our Marquette game leading up to it from last season, and although we didn't play too good, they, they played well. We didn't hit too many shots. We had six – I think it was six turnovers that whole game. And uh, coach just made it clear that that's what won us the game. And uh, when you can um, when you can maintain long runs and keep them balanced and not let them go on long runs, it, it's huge for us. So I would say, answering that, we just really focus on getting a good shot. And if you're not getting a good shot, not turning it over because our offense are rebounding so good, and it's it's been proven the last few years statistically that one of the best offense rebounding teams in the country. That uh, sometimes a bad shot is better than a turnover and that's most times and that's most scenarios. So really just taking care of it, running our sets. And uh, if they are, are on a run, just really executing. Do you think that like last year and Purdue fans have been talking about this for years, even before you were here about when teams want to press you guys, do you feel like now that you guys have been around each other more, you know, two years now with the same group that it's a little harder for teams to put the full court press on you? Yeah, I'd say that was a clear we, – we really wanted to make a statement in that first game. I think it was first game. Sanford, they, they pressed for 38 minutes. So I think us taking care of the ball that game and us handling the press, it just showed that if you want to try to mess up the game by, by doing that or playing some different way, that we can handle that, and it's not something that's going to throw us off. All right. Uh, Will, William Bill says, Fletch, you're my second favorite boiler behind Rick Mount. That's pretty high praise there. I know you got to meet Rick, so that must have been pretty yeah. cool for you. Yeah, it was cool. Obviously a legend. You see his name up in the rafters. You hear about him. One of the best shooters, scorers Purdue's ever seen. So being compared to a guy like that's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
And then Corey Lesney here, he's he wants to know what's for dinner. What are you eating for dinner here tonight? What's for dinner? We uh, so usually night before games, we either go out as a team or we get takeout as a team. Tonight we got the Bryant. It's a restaurant here in Lafayette, one of my favorites. So uh, from six to eight p.m., we can call in our takeout order. Oh, there you go. So if I call to the Bryant before game day and say, "Yo, this is Fletcher." I can get the hook up. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, well, uh, do you guys got anything else before we cut Fletcher loose? No. No. All right. Well, Fletcher, uh, thanks again for jumping on with us. I uh, hope you had a good Thanksgiving and everything. You a turkey guy? I'm not a turkey guy. I ate prime rib on Thanksgiving. I'm personally a ham guy. I eat ham. There you go. See? That's, Everybody that's gives true. me crap, Fletcher, because I hate on turkey. But I feel like there's more people on my side then people realize we're just, you know, nobody wants to be loud about it. And I'm the loudest guy in the room always. Yeah. You got, you got to do your own thing. So, <laughs> and, and then my other question too, is uh, my guy, Sasha, you guys taking care? How's he doing on the bench coaching you guys up? You, you keeping him honest? Yeah, we're keeping him honest. He, he does. Uh, so he calls the sideline and baseline out of bounds plays. That's kind of his gig. But, uh, no, he's been great for especially guys like me, guys like Cam and Miles, dudes on the wing, where he's been there, done that. He, he's gone through a lot. He played a lot of college games. It's someone we all trust and we'll watch film with, and he'll give us little tips that are very helpful. And uh, he's been great. Yeah, Sash, my guy. Um, so I'm sure one day you're going to pass him in threes. So I'll just have to accept that Fletcher, but I'll be rooting for you along the way. And, and we all will too. So, and everybody in the chat, appreciate, appreciate you coming on here tonight. So uh, yeah, go watch made. I'm telling you, you will not be disappointed. I'll definitely check it out. All right. Thank we'll talk you to you soon. Later, yep, Fletcher. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. That's Fletcher lawyer. Yes. The big, yeah. the, the big screen. Yeah. We don't do that often on here um, or the double logo here on the top. Look at that. Um, you know, uh, but we appreciate Fletcher Lawyer coming on and, and talking some ball with us. And the chat, the chat was after me early on, you know, because I got this yeah, they ball. Were. They're going after me. I see Mike always goes after me, and that's okay. I'm used to him. But, you know, we've got some new guys this year, you know, coming at me, Corey Lesney, you know, keeping us all honest. I have long questions. I don't know what to tell you. So uh, we're going to take a commercial break, and then I'm going to let these guys – handle it the rest of the way. Cause I got to go and do, uh, you know, my Chicago bears pre and post game show here at CHGO sports studios. So, um, hopefully root for the bears to give me a goddamn win because, uh, it's not easy covering this pitiful team, but luckily I'll carve out some time for the number one team in the country all day long. So, uh, but I'm going to go. So right. <laughs> I know you missed me. Was, I'm just gonna go before the commercial break. I, this, I know you guys are gonna miss me. What? Well, this, is was, the, this, this is the Midwestern goodbye no, in the middle no. of the show. No, I was saying this may be the first non-Midwestern goodbye in history. No, this for is Greg. this. I'm, you <laughs> knew I was gonna have a Midwestern goodbye. You just didn't know that it was gonna be in the middle of the show. Cause like I, it's I'm one of those guys that I don't know how to say like get off the phone. I don't know how to end a show. I always start rambling and, and being like, all right, I love you. Love you too. So, all right. We appreciate everybody tuning in, uh, in the chat. These guys are going to analyze a little bit more of what's to come here down the road. So please hit that like button while I'm gone. And then you won't have to hear my rambling. The more likes you get, the less I'll talk on the next show. Okay. I see Mike, you guys have a good night. Uh, thanks again to Fletcher lawyer. I'll see you guys here in a little bit. See you bud. See ya. So yeah. Um, Purdue graduate, this, you know, we appreciate, uh, BJ for, for sponsoring the show, this interview with Fletcher lawyer and, and just kind of the sport they've shown us over the past few weeks, Purdue graduate and current Lafayette resident BJ rule has close to 15 years experience helping buyers, sellers, and real estate investors in Lafayette and surrounding areas. If you're looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, give BJ a call or text to set up an appointment to see how he can help you accomplish your goals. Your home will likely be the most expensive purchase of your life. Have the experts with Rainey and Company at Keller Williams on your side and let BJ help you navigate this process. Call 317-345-4600. What was that phone number again, Joe? Uh, 317-345-4600. There we go. Yeah, and I, I've known BJ for a really, really long time. He's uh, also part of the livestock industry that, that I'm a part of as well. And just a really good guy and a really honest, trustworthy guy. Um, so... 
by all means, uh, for your real team needs in that area, uh, give BJ a call. But yeah, 100%. Let's talk some more basketball, Joe. Yeah, for sure. Uh, David Waltz, just as we're wrapping up the Fletcher lawyer uh, segment of this, Fletch, just a remark remarkably articulate guy, unlike me. Uh, appreciate the way you represent our university on and off the court. For anybody that's listening on audio, the unlike me was referencing me, Joe Jackson, not David Waltz. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I've had I've, I'm still going to give you my input and stuff. I know that you did a lot of media stuff in Hawaii and you ton of great content for us. I know you got some takes you got to get off your chest. So just I'm just going to let you kind of go where you want to go with right now. <laughs> yeah, I just I didn't I didn't get to talk about the team after any of the games. And I'm like, yep. I was just itching to do it. And honestly, things were so busy and chaotic. And then I got sick as soon as I came home. And I've literally been laid up in bed for like the last two and a half days. This is the first day that I've actually got up and moved around a little bit. Um, after getting back from Hawaii. And I'm not saying that I blame the two snot-nosed little kids that were sitting by me on the plane on the flight home, but I'm not saying that I'm not blaming them either. Uh, but either way, I'm starting to feel a little bit better. And I guess I, I just looking at the way that whole thing fleshed out is like, I, I feel like there's been a lot of conversation about each game along the way. But when you really go back and look at all three games as a whole, Purdue won those three games in, in different ways, and they had to play against teams that tried to beat them in different ways. Gonzaga wanted to get out and run. They really wanted to push the pace, and and for a while, Purdue just outscored them. Um, you know, Gonzaga had the lead at halftime, but Purdue just came right back and said, okay, if you're going to push the pace, here's Lance Jones. We're going to create some turnovers, and he's going to push the ball even harder. And then after he had his little run that got us kind of back on top, either through making shots or getting assists, other people kind of took back over. Not a real physical team. Then you flip that switch and you go to Tennessee, which is the like, I think I had a tweet that next day that was like, you know, if, if Gonzaga was poetry in motion, what is? And I asked people to fill it in. And the fill in the blank answers were, were pretty creative. Um, but that, that was a train wreck, um, just in terms of a basketball game and, and not how basketball is supposed to be played in terms of the amount of fouls that were called, the illegal physicality that was being played out there. And I respect the heck out of Tennessee. I think they're a top five team. But it was just an ugly, mucky game. And it's a type of game a lot of times, Northwestern last year, Maryland last year, a few other games last year, that you say Purdue loses a lot of times. And they found a way to win that game. They found a way to play through the physicality. Fletcher especially, and Zach, always and Zach, um, found a way to play through that physicality, even though they weren't shooting at the line well, to still win that game. And then you switch and you go to a Marquette game who also plays super intense defense, but better offensively than Tennessee, better defensively than Gonzaga. And they play defense really intense and with a lot of pressure without near the body contact and fouling that we see in Tennessee. And Purdue kind of has to have a, an elite game at both ends of the floor in that game to hold off and finally win that game. And all through that way, the Gonzaga game, you know, Braden, and, uh, Braden didn't have a great game against Tennessee, but he still impacted the game in a lot of different ways other than scoring. So, you know, to me, Braden and Zach were kind of your constants throughout those games. But we saw... Lance step up against Gonzaga. We saw Miles step up late against Gonzaga. In that Tennessee game, you see Fletcher step up huge. In several of those games, well, one I think it was a Tennessee game. Caleb plays a ton uh, because of defensive defensive purposes. And in that following game, Mason plays a ton uh, because they needed him out there to help stretch the floor. And maybe he was just a little bit better of a defensive matchup. TKR comes in in that last game against Marquette and gives six quick early points right away, I think, or four or six quick early points to kind of get things rolling right off the jump. I just, there's, you know, we look and we say, Purdue surely can't play a 10-man rotation all year. Who's not getting minutes late in the year? Because all of these guys have stepped up in different ways, even just in that three-game spectrum. Fletcher Lawyer said it about Ethan Morton, right? <laughs> Yeah. He sat on the bench and he came in ready to F and win. Where's his exact words? And he gets a block in the last minute. There are just so many contributions in so many different ways. This team can play because of Lance, Miles, Cam, 
can play in different ways than they can play last year. I That's my takeaway. I realize that was probably the longest I've ever talked for one single string on any of one of these shows, but I had three games of stuff to get off of my chest. All good. I have two of the games I did with Bragg, or one of the games we you were, you were able to hop on, I think. But yeah, the, you know, uh, I love Braggs, and there was one of the games that it felt like it was like eight minutes, and I was like, man, I, I haven't talked in a minute in a while. <laughs> um, but, you know, we love Braggs, and uh, you had a lot to get off your chest for sure. For me, and obviously I had my game-by-game -game breakdowns. Definitely go check those out after this if you haven't. Uh, they're up on YouTube. We're on Apple, Google, Spotify podcast. Um, just our, our post game breakdowns. We'll have one tomorrow uh, against Texas Southern. The first three games, right? If you remember our first produced first three games, it was obviously like, hey, this team's really good. There's these pieces, yada yada. Um, but then we were like, what's up with this rebounding? And I, you know, now when you look at it, they are. Um, it's still not like elite where they've been previously, but 82nd in offensive rebounding, 73rd in defensive rebounding. I think you're going to start seeing that number, those numbers like continue to increase. Um, it, it seems like ED is starting to get more into a rhythm, at least on the glass versus contributing. Like it's become, although the, it's become much less of a concern for me throughout the three games. And that's one of the bigger things I think in general for me, um, just, just in for the takeaway from Maui. Obviously, the free throw shooting is going to be something to monitor. And on the flip side, uh, this is uh, like something I will be looking for just to see if the regression ever comes because it should. Uh, Purdue right now is shooting 40.8% from three. That's 11th in the country. Their defensive three-point percentage is 22.9%, which is seventh. Um, I don't have the exact list. I assume that's probably the widest margin of any team in the country right now. Also, reason why they're probably number one is because hey, they defend the three well, they're shooting the three pretty well. Does that change though? Does do you know? Do either of those numbers start to slip back towards the middle? Um, be something I just monitor going forward. Yeah, no doubt. And I don't know if they shoot forty one percent for the year, um, <clears throat> but I do think they were. You know, and, and Painter said it all year last year that there are too many good three point shooters on that team to be shooting the percentage that they did last year. Yeah. Um, and. <laughs> You know, when a lot of people were screaming to get another just pure high percentage three-point shooter in the offseason, I think Painter was still, even after some tough stretches last year, I think Painter still truly believed that he already had shooters on his team. And it was just a matter of time before it started falling. Now, like I mentioned to, to somebody earlier this week who was pointing out how much better they're shooting this year, Purdue had stretches for an entire month last year where they shot 40% a couple of times and then, and then they would have a month stretch where it was way off. So I think the big thing is consistency. Can they consistently, and it doesn't have to be 41%, but can they shoot 37% as a team? Can they shoot 38% as a team? Like that's a healthy number that I think still wins a ton of games when you're one of the best rebounding teams in the country. And Oh, by the way, you're also a top five Ken Palm defense. And that's maybe yeah. something we should talk about. Like yeah. they, they just played, Three top 10 Ken Palm teams, and before mm -hmm. that, the number 32 Ken Palm team in the country, and they still have a top five Ken Palm defense in the country relative to who everybody else has played this year. So I think that defense has definitely stepped up a bunch, and I know some others may may talk about, you know, Lance has defensive moments and then maybe doesn't have some defensive moments, but the added just pressure and physicality. There's a way to – Ethan Martin guards really well but does not guard with the same type of physicality and just bodying up a guy like Lance Jones can do um, out on the perimeter and just knocking people off their path, off their motion, whatever it is. It just changes the way we play defensively in my mind. Yeah. hundred percent team. And uh, Christopher Tice says ED defensive player of the year, question mark. I obviously we are six games into the season. Um, I just don't see why he couldn't. He is, I think I said it after game two or three. I said everybody can debate who like the pure best defender is because of versatility and all that stuff. But nobody is more important to their defensive scheme than Zach Eady in the country. And I'm I'm confident in that. Um, teams are shooting right now um only 20% of their shots at the rim against Purdue, which uh, division one average is about 31%. So that's about 10% below. Uh, teams are shooting about what is that like about 50% in the paints or something like that, which is below D1 average. Um, just 
it's becoming like teams just are going to have to shoot jumpers. And then, like we said, like they're not shooting them well. And now when that happens, there's like, what are you supposed to do? Do you just try to attack Edie at the rim? And, and um, Marquette, I think, did a pretty good job of they're a team specifically that's designed that can hit a lot of floaters with Igodaro. Igodaro actually shot worse than I expected on floaters. It was only like five or eight or something. I thought, I swear he went like 10 for 10 um, is what it felt like. Kolik is another guy that can kind of do that. And so there's going to be these individual guys that can hit these mid range and hit these floaters. But in the long run, like it's just not good. Like those just are shots that um, aren't going to be like be successful in the long run is what I'm trying to say. Like, and Purdue's doing a good job, I think, of contesting on the perimeter for the most part. And that's with all, like, where you, if out of the starting five specifically, and I know TKR doesn't, hasn't really closed games, like, ED is a good defender. Jones is a good defender. Would you say anybody just straight up out of that starting five right now is a, like, a good defender? Outside Raven, of Jones. Maybe. Outside, outside of Jones and ED. <sighs> I think they're good defenders within scheme. Right. Yeah. We call them good. Def- and that's where I'm going is like they're a top five defense with because their scheme is so good. And that scheme is fully centered around ED. And and it wor- works really well for Braden to be in that type of defensive scheme because he has incredibly long arms. And like the other day, he had five steals. Uh, was that yeah. the Tennessee game? He had five steals, I think. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. And no, he I had think- three against. I'm, I'm on it. He had five against Gonzaga and three against Tennessee. Okay, yeah. I just remember in that Tennessee game, um, it felt like he got his hand on the ball when Dalton Connect tried to drive, like, I don't know, four or five times in like a 10-minute stretch. And then Dalton went to the bench yeah. <laughs> and sat down for a while because he he kept turning the ball or it wasn't necessarily turning it over every time, but losing the ball, and then it slowed the offense down. He got late in shot clock and whatnot. So I think he disrupts things a lot uh, with, with his – He's way longer in terms of arm wingspan than he is in terms of actual height, um, getting yeah. into passing lanes and get and just kind of digging down on people that are trying to trying to drive to the rim and whatnot. But no, I mean, just man on man, like really high caliber defensive player. Yeah, you're probably talking Lance and you're probably talking Zach and everybody else is within the system. I do think first, I guess he's a first, bench player. Yeah, but first, first is, is a really good defender. Yeah, for sure. To, to Chris's question, though, um, I saw this on, on Field of 68 the other night, actually. Randolph Childress said that he thought Zach Eady would be the defensive player of the year, and he didn't even think it would be close. Didn't even think it was a discussion. Uh, so that's former player, former coach saying that. So from that standpoint, Chris, there's somebody, there's somebody out there who knows basketball even better than the two of us, which isn't too hard, <laughs> who, who, who does agree with that point very much so. Oh, yeah, geez. So, what do you think? Craig, <laughs> do you think we'll lose a game this season from JB? Uh, yes, I, I do think we will lose a game this season. I do not think we'll, we'll go undefeated. Uh, Arizona, Alabama coming up. Both will be tough. Alabama doesn't look as good as maybe what we thought we would uh, coming into the season, but still have some big matchups. And the Big Ten is the Big Ten. And you saw last year, you lose some games within conference against teams that know you, that know all your actions, uh, that know all your tiny little weak spots, uh, especially on the road that maybe you wouldn't lose in a neutral court situation if they were from a different conference and you guys just showed up to play each other on a couple of days prep. So, yeah, I think we'll lose a game. But I think there's a chance it's only a few games, but I'm not going to go too far with that. Greg's the one that's like, we're never going to lose. So I'm I'm not taking that much uh, action right now. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you there. They'll lose it. They'll, they'll lose a few games. It's just how it's going to be. Um, yeah. Do you do you have anything else from Maui that you kind of want to talk uh, about? I know we will have another post game show tomorrow too. But oh yeah, that's tomorrow, isn't it? Um, yep. Eight thirty. Yeah. Yep. I've been in this sick haze for three days, so I it's all just kind of realizing what's going on. Um, I guess my only other big takeaways from from Maui is I think a couple of those teams are really good. I think Marquette is a really, really good team that is going to be wicked come March. Um, I know I told you that day that I, the way Tennessee plays, having to play the way they play three days in a row has to be hell. 
like <laughs> on their bodies. And I thought the third day they looked more tired than anybody else on the third day. And I personally think if Tennessee played Kansas day one, I, I don't think Kansas wins that game. Um, I came away really impressed with Tennessee, not overly impressed with Kansas, honestly. I um, think they're still a really good team, top 20 team. Don't know that they're a top five team long-term in my personal opinion. Uh, but I think Marquette, Tennessee, Purdue, all really, really high-end talent or teams. Yeah, fair. I, I was impressed with Tennessee. I mean, it's just, it was so many good teams there. Even like Syracuse was feisty. Yeah. Um, so there's one comment from Rowlett Boiler I wanted to bring up. We kind of were talking about the rotations and stuff. He says, I think it'll stay 10, just not yeah. 10 will play every game. It'll be matchup of and who is hot. Um, yeah, I think there will be that luxury a bit for Painter this year of, of having 10 guys that you can throw in if you need to. I do think the way I'm kind of reading this right now is it's it seems like Colvin and Heidi are competing for whoever's that wing spot. Um I, I just the way that the rotations are, it's Heidi gets a turn, Colvin gets a turn, and then it's kind of whoever fits better gets that second half run. Um, I don't know if that's good. I, I just can't see that staying that way for forever. There might be some matchups where it's Heidi is better maybe later in the year if he doesn't or vice versa, but uh, that's how I'm reading that. And then even just like, because I, I think Painter eventually gets down to eight. I think you have, you know, man, that's tough. Even eight, because if it's eight, yeah, because if he's it's not, eight, like I want to say two of them are first and Gillis, but then it's like, well, that's one play. It's, it might it might be closer to a nine. It almost might have to if you're going to play rotate first Gillis and TKR at the four. I mean, he rotated he, he rotated nine minute deep into the season last year. Still, did he? Yeah. Let's see. I pulled it. Yeah. I pulled it no, up. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. you're right. Um, and there were some games that it was less, but yeah, he would. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's gonna, probably gonna be nine. Yeah. Gills first is for sure. One of Colvin Heidi, maybe both. Um, I just assume Morton gets some minutes because of his ball handling capabilities is kind of the throw him in with Jones and whoever else he wants at like the three, uh, just to keep kind of two ball handlers out there. Right. Yeah. So. But yeah, it's, it's a good luxury that Painter's going to have this year. That's assuming, like, that's we're also just kind of assuming Waddell is is um, kind of stuck to the bench for the year. Who knows? Maybe something pops with him too. Obviously, they're you know that probably have to start within practice and things like that. Uh, but yeah, main takeaway: Hey, Purdue's good, and, and <laughs> I'm happy about that. That's and, that's definitely the main takeaway. I don't think we need to, we started this at six o'clock. I don't think we need to go on too much further. We're going to be back on with all of you tomorrow night after we play yeah. Southern Texas, Texas, Southern, Texas, Southern, either way. Yes. It's still in the South of Texas. True. But yeah. That is an eight 30 Eastern tip um, on the big 10 network. So we will be live right after Assuming nothing crazy happens, maybe it's a shorter one because I have a decent drive home after. And, you know, it's, I prefer getting home before like 1.30 a.m. But appreciate everybody tuning in. Follow him on Twitter at uh, Craig Bowers 34 Follow me on Twitter at Joe Jackson CBB. Follow Boilers in the Stands on Twitter at Boilers in Stands. Oh, that was what I was going to do. We did pick um, our giveaway winner on our Twitter. It was... I had this prepped. I was going to be a good host and be like, oh, here it is. And then I went off the page. Well, that's okay. Because while you're while you're looking for that, I uh, do need I to it. say uh, the photos from Maui Invitational that we showed tonight were provided by Brian Spurlock and Kemper Sports Live. Uh, those were provided to the uh, just media pool in general to use, but wanted to make sure we gave credit where credit was due on those Maui Invitational photos that you got to see tonight. Yeah, so the winner of our giveaway was Derek at DRKDXN on uh, Twitter. Um, you know, shout out to him for for supporting. Gets gets the Zach Eady signed jersey. If you're listening, I think you still uh, just let us know where we need to send it, and we'll get you that jersey. So, um, if you got if you're watching this long, we're wrapping up here. We'll be back tomorrow. Please just uh, drop a like. It, it's a simple thing, and it really does help us a lot. Uh, just help us keep you know getting these good guests on keep get, continuing to grow allow craig to to go to hawaii um and, and he'll go to toronto and and do all the things that we can for you um if so if yeah if you're enjoying please like subscribe on youtube 
Uh, follow us on Twitter at Boilers and Stands. We are on Apple, Google, and Spotify podcasts. If you prefer the audio platform, uh, please you know give a comment there or five star review helps us out on that front as well. Craig, do you have anything else? No, just if anybody knows the guy who won, tell, tell him to check his DMs because he hasn't yeah. answered. He does not know he's won yet. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I don't know, Joe. I don't know how long we wait for an answer before we draw another name. I'm not sure. That's we'll we'll figure that out when the time comes. But appreciate everybody tuning in. We'll be back tomorrow after the Texas Southern game. Um, and yeah, appreciate everybody tuning in. And yeah, catch you tomorrow.